Today, we have a very special episode as we celebrate and pay tribute to a lifelong entrepreneur, Emmett McHenry. You may remember him as the founder and chairman and CEO of Network Solutions International, Inc. We're going to talk all about that. I am just, I'm just excited that he's here. But let me just tell you a little bit about him. Um, we certainly don't have time in, in this um on this broadcast to to tell you all about him, but let me just share some information. And, and what you will know is that few individuals can claim to have influenced the web as we know it like Emmett McHenry. Born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as the eldest of nine children, McHenry founded and ran the company that shaped the modern internet network solutions in 1979. Beyond his rich entrepreneurial career, McHenry has distinguished himself as a mentor, communicator, and motivator, traveling extensively to virtually all corners of the globe, serving on dozens of boards and accumulating numerous honors and awards. And so we're really pleased that he's going to accept our award. Mr. McHenry directly oversaw several groundbreaking innovations, the development of the first internet protocols, the creation of .com, .net, .edu, and .gov domains, and the management of the world's first domain registrar, he ultimately facilitated the sale of network solutions to VeriSign for $21 billion in the year 2000. McHenry went on to found a network engineering and security company. With Netcom, he received awards for service excellence from IBM, NASA, Lucent Technologies. Well, I haven't heard that in a while. While overseeing 200 employees and accruing $260 million in revenue. An undeniably technology visionary, McHenry um, correctly predicted and successfully capitalized on the convergence of voice and data communications decades before the ubiquity of the internet. Please help me welcome Mr. Emmett McHenry. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. How are you today? Well, thank you. I am superb. I I'm like you. <laughs> Aren't you a charming person? I, you know, I just sit in awe of, um, uh, and again, we'd like to thank you for allowing us to honor you. You've accomplished so much. You are a role model for so many. And so it's just nice to have you as a part of this conversation. And then ultimately as a part of our ceremony on October 12th, as we recognize um, the best of the best with the induction of our 50th anniversary Leaders and Legends um, Hall of Fame. And so we have kind of characterized some of our Hall of Famers and we look at you as certainly one of our trailblazers. Well, thank you. It's nice to be thought of as a beginning person versus- Yeah. A person. yeah. Oh my goodness. You've had an amazing journey and given where you've started, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, eldest of nine children to what you did with Network Solutions, with Netcom, with all the things that you've been doing over the last few decades and to where you are right now, can you tell us, can you tell this audience on this journey, what do you th see as three most important things that you've learned along the way? Well, let me begin a little differently. I was really born in Arkansas, Forest City, Arkansas. Okay. And my grandparent, my mother was very concerned about me growing up there. And she sent me to live with my grandparents in Tulsa. Mm. So I grew up in Tulsa, was greatly influenced by the culture of the black community in Tulsa, highly entrepreneurial. But I must say my, my mother's family was equally as entrepreneurial. So uh, that's by context. What have I learned? Before you, before you go there, because I, I can't get, um, I need to ask you about the Tulsa piece and you said entrepreneur. Yeah. So what was the business climate like for African-American in Tulsa when you were growing up? Well, my, my family, so let's start there more narrowly, mm -hmm. were in the concrete construction business. And they were able to build streets as well as sidewalks and basements and all of that, that stuff. But they were really individual entrepreneurs who came together for large projects. So my grandfather, my uncle and father, and two 
grand uncles were all kind of working together. What I came away with from that was the, the collaboration and the work ethic. Uh, and the fact that it's interesting in our society, quite often in the black community, we see blue collar as not necessarily economic at the same status as white collar. Hmm. Well, I had the experience that blue collar was very <laughs> economically. <laughs> okay. It was a lucrative place to be. Okay. And uh, good times and bad times at work. So that was one thing. I was also a paper boy in Tulsa. And I owned lots of little jobs in the community, but in my, and, and which gave me great insight in the people who lived in my community. So in a two to three block stretch, we had blue collar workers that independently had businesses of their own, all the way to the doctors, the lawyers, uh, folks who work for folks, uh, folks who work for folks with money, folks who had money. All of that I got a chance to see as a, as a kid. And unlike some things I see today, all of those people were community. I mean, the status was not a big deal as, as much as status is a deal today. And that was uh, inspirational. I saw the people who had designed and built their own homes. I'll give you two examples of something important to me. Uh, Mr. Cannon had gone to college to be a landscape architect and he couldn't find a job when he came out. So he, uh, when I knew him, had bought land, designed and built his own home, and recognized that uh, there were things of value that people threw away all the time. And so he got into the scrap metal business. And that ended up getting four kids through college, him having a good life. And his was one of my favorite homes as I, as I was on my paper route. Another comes from my own family. I had a, my mother's cousin, who's my godfather. I have to make this story very, sh the story very short. Was the first integrated business person I'd ever seen who started with A, buying a trash collection route, to collecting trash, seeing that there was valuables in trash, being able to separate those values into their own businesses. And so he got into the scrap metal business and the newspaper business, et cetera. But ultimately, when he retired, he was a pig farmer. Now, how do you go from being a garbage collector to a pig farmer? Okay. Because you recognize in restaurants, they throw away a lot ah. of food. And if okay. you give them special containers and negotiate a better price point, they will separate all of that stuff. Because in those days, you could feed pig slop and grow them to the stage that you... So I've always seen people who had a vision... Mm. about how to make money from things. Uh, and they were doing the things that they wanted to do because they were free of other authority at that point. And that was um, highly motivational to me. And as my grandfather used to say, you got to be able to count. <laughs> You're going to lose. <laughs> you got to be able So I was always interested in math and science. Uh, in the scrap collection business, you learn that there's a lot of stuff being thrown away that could be repaired. And so I always got into the mechanics of things. How do you build stuff? So those gentlemen in that community uh, had a significant impact. Outstanding. And so tell me a little bit more. And so growing up in Tulsa uh, the, the, um, and, and getting your first taste of entrepreneurship by your environment, mm -hmm. how did you parlay that into um, where you were in the position at Network Solution? Well, none of these things are easy because mm -hmm. in Tulsa, I was an athlete, fortunately a, a good student, but I always had jobs. And I worked at a country club and I worked at a country club with the really rich and saw how the really rich lived. Okay. And that was a little different than my community. Um, and they were business people of a different kind. They were corporate business people versus entrepreneurs, necessarily. Some entrepreneurs would become corporate guys. Uh, so when I went to university, I was going to be a physicist. That was my, my big thing, physics. Loved, I started, started uh, I read Einstein's biography between the eighth and ninth grade. And my grandmother used to look at me and say, boy, why aren't you out there playing with the rest of the kids? I said, I am wow. playing. I'm playing in my head. Anyway, long story short. Um, 
network solutions. I was, after undergraduate school, I went to work for IBM as a systems engineer. And I did the Marine Corps. And that was probably, and, and when was that, Emmett? That was the transition between unit record equipment and the 360. Okay. So I learned to program with wires. Remember that? Wiring boards? Mm-hmm. You know wiring boards. No, I'm going to tell you when, I'm going to tell you when I entered that world, yeah. but go ahead. Yeah. And from that, I was in the 360 where we really got around to doing real software development. And that was a good thing for me. I really uh, learned a lot. And where were you at the time? Where where in IBM? I was in Denver, Colorado. Okay. I started in Denver, went to Seattle. uh, And that was, you know, we had all the advanced schools on the various regions. In the West Coast, it was Seattle. Um, And then worked in Minneapolis for a while. And then went into the Marine Corps. Another long story we won't get into today. But I got my hands really into the building of solutions and that fit me that fit me well and that kind of fit the experiences i'd had and i start and from there i went to doing turnaround deals when i say turnaround companies who had stumbled and thought they wanted a different way of looking how to run their businesses and that was very positive that made a one of the things you learn along the way one of my favorite sayings clarity is power and clarity is based on understanding purpose and desired outcomes. When you see organizations faltering, quite often it is they've lost a sense of clarity. They lost a sense of the focus of the why of the business and what's the outcome we're trying to get here. And so mm-hmm. understanding that, I did three significant consulting jobs for large companies. And while doing one, I had this idea. It came from, you may have read about this, but I was reading... Uh, Fortune magazine did a big thing about AT&T and IBM. And then the New York Times Sunday edition did a major piece on what's going to happen between these two big companies. And I just had a bang, one of those mind things, you know, I said, we're talking about competition. That's not the level of competition. It's the convergence that's the issue because this is all digital stuff now. We're going to have a convergence of voice and data communications. Talked to someone about that, a guy named Ty Grigsby, actually, and he challenged me to do something about it. And that led to the founding of Network Solutions. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so in him challenging you, but did he offer you cash in order to... Um... No, no, of course not. This is, a, <laughs> this is a fellow brother. Come on. <laughs> he was visiting... I, no, once did... a year, once a year in Maine, I'd have a big weekend party or a Labor Day weekend, and I was out on the porch, and he was staying with us, and he came out, and we were chatting. He said, well, what are you going to do about it? You know how brothers, we said, well, what are you going to do about it? You got this idea, what are you going to do about it? Uh-huh. And I, of course, I took that as a challenge, what am I going to do about it? I'm going to, yeah, okay. Anyway. How, uh, did you find, how did you find it? How, well, uh, every last, well, we've got two partners join us. I, every last penny you had, I mean, the mortgage payments and all of that, that's how we funded it. There weren't uh, the v, venture capitals and the East Coast and that part of the world. Mm-hmm. Was so, and then I moved the family. Uh, ultimately, we came to D.C. Um, fortunately, I had a little money. Everybody had a little money. We used a little money that we had to make it work. Uh, we didn't go outside for money until... Oh, probably about our 15th, 14th year or so. And we had some new tech we wanted to bring to market. And um, I met a guy from um, Kodak. And we and I chatted with him about this stuff. And he said, that sounds interesting. You should come visit at some point. So I went to Rochester, New York. And uh, this is... This is, this is in part the TCP IP protocol. We had developed the TCP IP protocol and um, met with him, met with his man. He was the vice president. I met with the, the vice chairman, uh, these guys. And, you know, I'm a young guy. I have no fear. <laughs> I have no status. I mean, it's just is. This is what is. I mean, this is in my head. And I talked to them about the impact this could have on their businesses. And so... They made a loan to us of $2 million, but they could vault TCP IP. My guarantee was the protocol. Okay. 
They believed enough in the protocol to lend against it. They made one other request. The vice chairman said, I want you to talk to the execs in our company and see if you can't sell them on what you're doing. I failed. And I went back to him and said, I've tried. He says, I know, I've tried to. Kodak at the time, and it's to their downfall, was a chemical company. Okay. And they didn't get the internet. They didn't get the protocol. They didn't get that. The people I talked to didn't get that. Now, you must remember that Kodak had some of the major advances in technology in their museum. The fax machine, the copy machine, mm -hmm. uh, the first digital communications devices. They had all of that as a part of their museum, but they hadn't brought any of the products to market. Most of the things in the 80s that the Japanese brought to the market, Kodak had pets. Wow. It's amazing. So um, that, was, uh, that was the first funds we got into the company from outside. The rest of the funding was we'd make money and then we'd invest all of our money in the next year, and then we'd make money and invest it all the next year. So we were self-funded, which hmm. meant that we were not the richest guys in town. But Just we were having smart. fun. Yeah. You were having fun and you were the smartest guys in town. So Some what led that. Yeah. Some so what led to ultimately you selling it? We had been together 18, 19 years, the partners. Wow. They're Spouses wanted more, they wanted more. And so become millionaires was okay. Mm -hmm. I really didn't want to sell. But after we sold, I had a significant stake in SAIC, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately that's a different story. I decided that wasn't the place for me. So I started Netcom Solutions International. And we grew that to oh, around North of, yeah, I guess 260 plus million in less than six years. Wow. And then things happen in the marketplace like they're happening now. Mm -hmm. you know, markets make a difference. That's Always it. keep a little something in reserve to take care of the downturns in the market. That sounds like great advice. Can you repeat that again for our listeners in terms <laughs> of with your experiences and you've yeah. seen the economic downturns and upturns and all those kinds of things? What is your what is your advice? Always keep something in reserve for downturns in the marketplace. A conservative investment will get you through a lot of stuff. Cash is power. Cash is king. Cash is, is the it. Uh, and though currencies go up and down, look at what's happened in the UK with currency. I'd rather have their currency than to be broke because the markets went down. So that's some of the stuff along the way. That's incredible stuff along the way. And so is there any deal that you regret you did not do? Actually, more than one, but yeah, deal I didn't do. Um, I wish I had been early on more aggressive with acquisitions. We spent too much time building selling, doing, when there are companies that were available to be acquired, we should have acquired more. Mm. A few years ago, I missed an opportunity uh, on a tech that's has done well. You know, I, kooky as it sounds, I've, I've got an eye for for tech and what the market, what's going to be in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I had the idea for what became LinkedIn in 1979 on a drive from Washington, from Portland, Maine to Washington, DC, sketched it out in my mind. Year, a couple of years later, I talked to one of my guys about it, but we never did anything with it because we were so busy managing the day to day. You got to find some time to step away from the day to day to think. It's really all about thinking and innovation. Those are the winners, the thinkers and innovators. Mm -hmm. Thinkers and innovators, but it's, it also sounds like you then know you then need to figure out when to act. Yeah. Well, acting is always key, and that's multi elements. You know, acting. It's not just you acting; it's your team's acting. It's a recruiting and organizing people around you that you trust. 
who in and of themselves will challenge you with new ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes a big difference. And you want to be challenged. You don't ever want to be the smartest person in the room about everything. You want people smarter than you about what they do. I think leaders' roles is to motivate, stimulate, help organize, help focus. But it's not necessarily being the smartest person in the room. You can get in trouble being the smartest person in the room. There are some exceptions to that, you might say. You might say uh, uh, the guy at Apple, but he had a partner who was a brilliant doer. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone talks about jobs, but you got to remember, without his partner, he couldn't have done very much because he was just, he was a marketing, he was a thinking guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at uh, what's happening now, everyone thinks he's a little crazy, but he's into rocketry. He's into this whole, a whole variety of stuff. Um, but he selected really smart people around him. I think that's the key. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, don't be afraid of having people smarter than you about yeah. what they do. That sounds like great advice. You talked about the your one of your favorite quotations is clarity is power. Did yeah. you have any any mentors along the way that that left a, a, a the you know the best impression in terms of being a guiding force in some of the things you were doing? My mentors were not necessarily in, in business. Okay. That was, um, I would have done better. Well, it's not. I, I, the reason I hesitate, because now I've got to go back and live lots of moments. Uh, I met a guy who stimulated a program I developed. Uh, in, uh, I, I developed this corporations of upward communications and around a participative management thing for large corps. And there was this guy that introduced me to workplace redesign, how to take and redesign work, space, work operations in a way that you could, the people were part of the innovation, the doers were part of the innovation. It wasn't just outsiders coming and doing surveys and looking at what they did, but getting people involved in, in re-engineering their workspace. And I in, integrated with that technology. I integrated, I, I, my innovation was to bring compute to the table so that they could use compute as a means of facilitating what they did and began to have them spend more time thinking about what needed to be done, but not doing all the do's, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, he was great. Another guy, a guy from a thousand years ago, now I think about his name, was Ted Harrington. He, um, he's the guy with the steel trap mind. He had a memory like, uh, gee, like a vault. And I'm losing my memory like a vault. But uh, Ted introduced me was one of the first people to really introduce me to large corporate stuff as a consultant. And that uh, that was important to have his nurturing and as much as anything, providing me the opportunity to work with him on large corporate consulting. Outstanding. And so as you move into today's technology arena, we have moved into it with cybersecurity, mm -hmm. What what do you see on the horizon? Hmm. Uh, my silence is because it brings back new. Look, let's start with where we start. The start is we're all under attack. Privacy is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we all want privacy and we all want to have our assets, particularly our digital assets. And what isn't a digital asset anymore? all your finances, the digital assets, all the records, et cetera, et cetera. You want to protect those things. You want to keep a mm -hmm. sense of self. Corporations want it. And there are lots of people who want access to what you have. And so e the evolving technology around not just being able to, oh, we've been attacked. That's a little late. You really want to prevent people getting access. And that's what we've worked on. We've worked on multi-layer of 
being able to protect the assets that you have. The other piece that everyone's talking about, and it's rightly so, it dawned on me some years ago that I had lots of passports and I wasn't always remembering all of those. I had to stop and work and think through because I didn't want to write them down because someone might see them, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're there, multi-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. Passwords are the weak link, but we have facial recognition, we have retinal scanning, uh, and then we can add other liveness tests to prove that I am alive, right? By some action right. that's a random act that you want me to do. I, mm -hmm. I close my right eye and open my left, whatever, whatever. So there are lots of things we can do around multi-factor authentication. So between multi-factor authentication, which we're working, and the ability to protect from the outside so no one gets through um, is important. And though we don't talk about it enough, it's the culture of cybersecurity. Creating a culture where the people around you are part of the ongoing protection of your access, assets. Mm -hmm. That's really, really critical. So we're getting lots of stuff in cybersecurity done. I think uh, we're excited about where we are and what we're developing and bringing to market. We've been told by analysts there's nothing like it in the marketplace. So. We just got to raise more money so we can bring it to market sooner. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we're on the verge. Of, I think we are not just on the verge. We have something very special. Well, we can't not, we cannot wait to see what that is. And given your track record, we know that it's going to be phenomenal. And so I think that would be good to have it as a phenomenal thing. Yes. I like that idea. Yeah. It will be. And ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first that we're going to be watching and waiting to see what's going to be rolled out as it relates to having the Emmett McHenry um, magic dust sprinkled out on it. And we know it's going to be successful. No, it's the Cycurion magic dust. <laughs> and, and the people of Cycurion that you'll be looking for, I'll be someplace in the background applauding. But your handiwork will be there. We have no doubt. You know, along, I just have a couple more questions and certainly appreciate your time. Along the way, um, as, a, as a Black man, you've seen a lot happen. Um, and, um, and although you have been in an industry that has enabled you oftentimes, well, sometimes I'm making assumptions, um, has often um, enabled you to do things in spite of. I should say, might be a wrong assumption. Where do you see, for example, minority businesses in a general sense um, in the future versus what you've experienced over the last few decades? We're 50 years old. And I tell people that, you know, it's good news that we, they're 50 year old advocacy organization. The bad news is that we're still having that same conversation about yeah. an, wealth gap, inequality, parity all those kinds of things. Do you have any, any thoughts about that? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Relationships are important. Um, people support people that they know. Mm -hmm. I've not been good at establishing lots of relationships. I've just not taken the time. It's not my focus, but being available, establishing relationships makes a difference. Um, most folks do business with folks who look like that. It's just the way the world is. We as a tribe don't do enough work together and we don't support each other in terms of investment capital. Don't, and I say that with a level of authority. I don't say that just in passing. I, I believe this to be true, that we don't mm -hmm. invest work with our own nearly enough. Recently, someone told me about, he had access to lots of investment capital. And uh, I was excited. Started chatting with him about what we did. But what he brought to me was a mess, was a, it was not the level of availability that he would have brought to Swartz 
or to James or something. Just different level, different level. So your track record doesn't always have the same impact. Now, having said that, those are the negative sides. On the positive side, boy, do we have so many smart folk in our tribe who are now well-educated in corporate America, seeing the evolution of new products and new ideas. Okay. The entrepreneurial challenge will be, will they take the risk? I mean, I took a risk. I mean, I left money. I left corporate planes and all of that jazz to become a full-time entrepreneur. But I was an entrepreneur as a kid. Remember, I was a paper boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you going to say? Um, I think that's part of the challenge for entrepreneurship, whether the, the folk who are so well situated, who have such a deep understanding about certain markets, certain technology, and a sense about certain sets of problems that the big corp can't really address right now because they're distracted by the big, what they consider the bigger issue, but the small issue of not addressing become a big issue. I think that that's part of the challenge. We need, we have the opportunity for more collaboration. We have the resources for more collaboration. Okay. And so I don't see any of what might be considered negative outside of our own control. Mm. I, uh, the world is a big place. The United States is just a piece of that. I've been blessed to lead companies in England, Europe, for all of Europe as an entrepreneur, South Africa uh, for Africa, um, Zimbabwe, et cetera, et cetera. I've invested in companies in lots of places. And in each of those places, I could find members of my tribe, my national continental origins, mm -hmm. uh, who were brilliant at certain things that they did. On the other hand, there are also folks who want to take advantage of you. You, just, you mm -hmm. got to be smart enough not to simply say, well, your face looks kind of like mine. Uh, let's do something together. Trust, but verify. That's the one thing that Reagan said that I absolutely support. Trust, but verify. I like that. Trust, but yeah. verify. Yeah. yeah. Makes a difference. It's the difference between, and I have lost lots of money by investing in people as the front end investor whose money was used to try to raise additional funds. Okay. And those funds weren't raised. So you got to begin to look at, do you want to be, can, what's the group that's going to come in here? And what's the plan for raising enough money to really launch the business? Because you can eat up a lot of cash as a starter enterprise uh, from folk uh, without ever getting to the product stage. So I want to know that, A, you've invested everything you've got, and B, we're in a position that I'm a part of, not the one of, to make this thing happen. With part of and not the one of. I love that. Looking back, how would, if you have, how would you have capitalized network solutions if you had to do that differently? What would, you know, how much more capital would you have raised? Oh. Because isn't part of it, we don't know. No, 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 no. It, yeah, this is, often we, you know, look, I needed the two million. So I accepted the two million. Mm -hmm. The two million, we were able to pay back, by the way did not give us the wings to fly. Mm -hmm. If I'd been able to raise 50 million, 30 million, uh, then the billions would have been ours, wouldn't have been someone else's. Mm -hmm. We ended up selling because people were burned out. Uh, and by the way, we sold to SAIC. SAIC took it public as I had recommended they did. And then it was sold, VeriSign. And that was the 22 billion. What they sold was a fraction of what we had created. We were just, the non-compete didn't allow us to compete with some of the other tech that we had brought. Hmm. Then later, I found out that someone recently, someone acquired it for, you know, things go up and down. On the downside, it was sold for 215 million or some number. I said, if I only, Kept my eye on it. I think I could have raised the money to buy that at two hundred and fifty million, mm -hmm. because of its validity and the ideas that we 
of ideas I had at the time of things it could have done differently or in addition to. Hmm. We should be talking about is TCPIP. That's the deal. That's oh, what we're well, well, let's that talk. On the space show. Let's, let's, let's talk about that protocol. So tell me about TCPIP. You don't have to be the first. You just have to be the one who's willing to take the bigger risk. Okay. The professors at UCLA were playing with a protocol, transmission control internet protocol, and they had they made some progress, but not dynamic enough. And what's that about? That's about allowing. When we when I was young, IBM did not talk to Honeywell. Honeywell didn't talk to et cetera, et cetera, all that jazz, right? So the protocol allows different machine manufacturers to communicate with each other. Right now I'm sitting here using a Dell over there. I've got a Mac. They all communicate, right? That's what we did. And the significance of it that when the space shuttle program had to select a means of communicating, TCP IP was that that protocol. Wow. At one point we had 135 people at Johnson Space Flight Center working on those issues. And I by the way, as an aside, my great angst, I didn't get to know the computer, the sister who was doing all that computational stuff. Oh, okay. Did, we were over, we overlapped with her. Mm -hmm. Jesus, how could that happen? Well, you get focused, you get focused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was, I considered one of the, and so we took that little code and built it in two million lines of code later and all the money we could find and the money we could borrow to get to, to marketplace. And that became your dynamic internet. Without that, the internet would have failed. Hmm. There's a lot in wow to unpack and unwrap it with that. And so that's what, where we had raised more money. Money Life okay. would have been really different. Raise what uh, about how much more money? Remember, I said we borrowed two million, right? But that I was, was thinking if we could have gotten 25 to 50 million, okay. And I can't say the exact number, that would have made a universe of difference. Universe. Would, you have, would you have thought it possible then? Oh, to raise, of course, mm -hmm. uh, to raise the money, no, right? And how would you know we were able to raise two million at that time? It wasn't well, that seems like an awful lot at that time, wasn't well, it? I didn't know. This is in Washington, D.C., metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. I didn't know folks who were raising money like that. Mm -hmm. There was a, a group in Philadelphia that invested in some companies. Um, I met with, I can't think of the name of the, the group now, and I know it so well. Um, they invested in a couple of deals, but they weren't technology deals. They were service deals. Uh, and they took a couple of companies public did not do very well eventually, but yeah, they were, but no one, this would sound cruel of my own tribe. I don't think people, I tried talking to folk in our tribe who had money. They didn't get it. They thought I was they, out of my geek, geek They didn't head. understand. Yeah. yeah. didn't understand it. And I used to say, maybe I'm not a good communicator. My Sometimes it's mm -hmm. not being a good listener. Hmm. That's is, okay. is the issue. Yeah. Because my question was is around, um, and, and I can see people not understanding because you were in the forefront of stuff. Is this, you know, was this like in the PC? So was this like in the eighties? Yes, okay. late eighties, of course. Okay, late eighties through the nineties. Yeah, we mm -hmm. sold the company in the early nineties. Which, we really, by the way, by the way. Because of where we are in the market and the cost of money, we started our company when Jimmy Carter was president. Okay. And the interest rates were what? Up in the 20s? They wow. They to be that hot. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. With everything that's kind of going around now in the, in the country, um, I, I do. It seems like the timing might be right. Um, so I do hope that, and, and all the knowledge, of course, that you bring to the table in terms of how to really, because that is something that 
a lot of business struggle with, not only businesses of color, but all businesses. And, and that's the undercapitalization of a business. But at the same time, it's like, how do you know? I think we're smarter about it now, but I would imagine then, how do you know what the what the ceiling of capital you could have raised on new ideas? Uh, yeah. You know, and that's one of those not good use of time question as an entrepreneur. The only and so, thing is for an entrepreneur is what can I learn from what I did or didn't do? Mm. What did I what could I have done differently? Who do we see in the marketplace that has done what I wished I had done? And see how that works. Because there are always patterns for success, a lot of patterns. And I think we as a tribe have to not let the fact that someone not looking like us did something and got through and we didn't get in the way. I think that um, the fundamentals are, if we can can model it right, and this is a day, you know, this is big data analytics, a lot of data that we can play with here. This is a much richer environment uh, to sell into because of all of the access to information mm -hmm. that we've got, data. So I think I hold myself responsible for shortcuts. One of the things I did not do, and so I challenge, I, I had a controller, not a CFO. Mm. I really needed, given how busy and given the struggle, we really needed a world-class CFO. That would have been a, a difference that makes a difference. Controller, he was great at that, but uh, didn't have the insight around the capital markets and how to work with them. We went to Wall Street, by the way, but a third party take us to Wall Street, make some pitches. Um, oh, in private, I'll tell you some horror stories. <laughs> oh, so you're not going to tell me now. No. <laughs> okay. But you talked about... Well, um, I'll tell you and you can edit it out. Okay. One of the groups we went to meet with, um, and the guy took me, happened to be a white guy with lots of expertise and experience in capital raising. He wanted me to meet this black guy who was on Wall Street, had money, da da da. You know, during the whole pitch, he was trading. He never stopped trading to talk. It was such a waste of money and time. And if he had picked up the gauntlet, all the trades he did that day, weren't a fraction of what he could have had. Could have made, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Sometimes things happen. Yeah. Sometimes. Another thing I would say, don't allow yourself to get angry. Anger is debilitates your decision-making, one. Two, don't let be forced to make a decision at the moment. If you can't sleep on it, it's probably a decision that's not worth making. You know, that is very, for everyone, that is very, very important. Don't be forced into making a decision. If you cannot sleep on it, then it's not, maybe not worth making that decision. Well, it, the risk of it's not being your best decision are pretty high. Okay. Hmm. And that is, if you don't feel it's a great decision, then it's like I gotta sleep on. We we'll mm -hmm. talk tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And most people will respect that. The yeah. folks, oh no, got to be make a decision now. It's now or no decision at all. Okay, no decision at all. The decision is no. So sometimes you have to just walk away from it. Yeah. Not a person you want to do business. Okay, that's really great advice. Mm -hmm. How much time do you spend lecturing people? I mean, you have so much to offer in terms of your experience. I'm just, you know, I would love to, um, for to do an in-person session with you so our entrepreneurs could learn. But that's another request for another day. But it was just, you have so much, so much knowledge to offer and experience. This is just awesome. I feel I've like I've been on the planet a long time. <laughs> I'm planning to be here a lot longer, but I've been on the planet <laughs> a, a long time. And you've been actively involved active, for a long time. I've been actively involved for a long time. Yeah. Wow. This is incredible. Incredible. So thank you 
again, very, very much. I don't know if there was, is, if you have any parting kind of words for our audience in terms of um, our entrepreneurs. I mean, you've yes. given us a lot of great nuggets, but you know, this do you have the best game in town? Say that one more this, time. Business is the best game in town. If you like sports, if you like any of that competitive stuff, business is the place to be. Why? It asks for commitment. It asks for discipline. It asks for physical fitness and mental fitness. And it rewards you for it. I love that. And you heard it here. It's a direct quote, quote from Emmett McHenry. 